Hi, everyone. Thank you for tuning in from all over the world. My name is Kelly Blunt, co-chair of the ABA International Law Section's Young Lawyers Interest Network. I'm so happy to introduce this program today called What Governs Blockchain Applications, Perspectives from Data Privacy, Cybersecurity Tools, and Sanctions Authorities. This program is presented by the International Law Section, the Young Lawyers Interest Network, but it's also co-sponsored by the ABA International Law Sections Committees of Privacy, Cybersecurity, and Digital Rights, the International Criminal Law Committee, the Lawyers Abroad Committee, the Middle East Committee, the Art and Cultural Heritage Law Committee, and last but not least, the Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Committee of the Tort Trial and Insurance Practice Section. It is my great pleasure to also introduce to you today's moderator, moderator Maria Goretti Tai. Goretti is a graduate in the LLM Entertainment Law Program from UCLA, currently collaborating with the Inter Intellectual Property Group, PLLLC, on copyright and art law. Prior to law school, she studied art history and cultural management in Hong Kong, France, and Italy, and she has worked in marketing and communications in the cultural and advertising industries. She is a steering group member of the ABA International Law Section, Art and Cultural Heritage Committee, and Public Outreach for the IP Section Fashion Law Committee. Grady, thanks so much. Thank you, Kelly, and hello, everyone. Let me go for some house rules before our presentation. So um, for the webinar, the audience is on mute, and please feel free to key in your questions in the Q&A boxes as we go along, and we will try to get through them in the end. And we are recording this program, so you will get a copy in your email if you're already registered on the Zoom link, and it will be also posted on the ABA's website about a week later. So today we are very fortunate to have a truly international panel with us in this virtual space. And in the order of speaking, uh, we have the following speakers. So Niccolo Fasano from ProTV. Niccolo is an information and cybersecurity advisor. He studied information and communication technologies, IT systems, virtualization, cloud computing, database management, networking, and IT security. He is currently a consultant focused on cybersecurity. Previously, he was involved in protection of personal data and IT security, with particular focus on risk management issues, GDPR compliance, policies and procedures relating to information security and internationally recognized security standards and frameworks. Piero Bologna from DKS Station Observatory Digital Innovation. Piero is a legal consultant and blockchain advisor, mainly focused on supporting multinational companies. After an experience in a data protection consulting firm in which he was involved in GDPR compliance program and DPO as a service, he is now predominantly involved in assisting both Italian and multinational companies in dealing with international contracts negotiation, IP and IT related issues and data protection. He holds an LLM in interna international business from the University of Hong Kong and a JD from the University of Trieste, Italy. Marina Lorenzini from Belfort Center for Science and International Affairs, JF Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University. Marina is the project coordinator with Belfort Center at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. In this role, her research focuses on arms control, critical infrastructure vulnerabilities, emergency preparedness, and sanctions across the East Mediterranean and Persian Gulf regions. Prior to joining the Belfry Center, she held positions at Malachi Associates, the Nuclear Flats Initiative, and the International Human Rights Clinic at Harvard Law School. She is an advanced speaker of Arabic and Italian, having used the languages extensively throughout her career and has the reading proficiency in Latin and Persian. So I would like to, um, yeah, just to give you a context that in February, uh, the number of series in uh, ABA in NFT series was called the NFT as a creative tool for business development, investment and social justice is available on the ABA's website if you want to review it. And um, so that's why um, we are having this webinar number two right now, because mainly uh, the audience concerns were on this new technology that are related to cyber security and data privacy. And um, yeah, so we are going to start um, with the presentation. 
So as we know that the crypto market is worth two trillion uh, US dollars and $44.2 billion worth of cryptocurrency has been sent on ELC721 and ELC1155 contracts. So these are Ethereum smart contracts that are associated with the NFT marketplaces. But just last year, the cryptocurrency based crime reported a stolen value of greater than 14 billion US dollars. So we are facing a really significant problem in the crypto market right now. So Likolo, can you help us um, you know, to try to understand how the crypto smart contract Bitcoin NFT intertwine with each other and uh, tell us the more often integrated uh, security issues in the blockchain and the NFT ecosystem. Yeah, thank you, Maria. Well, let's start saying that usually when a new solution or technology is introduced in the market, people think straight away about the benefits and innovation while ignoring a very important aspect that is the security of the new solution. Today, indeed, we rely on information technology, and once we adapt a technology, we transfer our, da our, uh, our daily processes inside it without paying attention to possible problems for our society, security and society, because we simply do not see them. This uh, aspect of the human behavior is uh, easily exploited by cyber criminals, and uh, this uh, threat cannot be underestimated. We must not imagine cyber criminals as the hackers uh, we see in the series on Netflix, but instead as real organized groups with a structured organization similar to that of large companies and with collaborators similar to uh, specialized and highly paid employees. We can say that uh, in this landscape, the fast diffusion of a relatively new uh, technology like blockchain can be an opportunity, but also a threat. Uh, this technology can rely on its efficiency and a secure operating model. In fact, the blockchain benefits from a principle that in cybersecurity is called security by design. Uh, the blockchain is based on a distributed ledger, which, which is also immutable, and uh, every transaction is tracked, verified, and secured by the use of uh, cryptography. This aspect uh, make it uh, a secure technology by default. Problem is that hackers also know the potential and the great use of this technology and taking, taking advantage of it to uh, evolve uh, their own attacks. So the question is, can the blockchain be hacked? And to answer this question, we have to start with the three uh, additional questions that uh, hackers ask themselves. First of all, uh, what are the vulnerabilities? And also uh, among these, what are the vulnerabilities that can be exploited? And as anyone else uh, already had some success with the hack, and one of the most common uh, blockchain vulnerabilities is outside of the blockchain itself, and this is the endpoint vulnerability. Endpoints, just as you might expect, as are the spaces where humans and blockchain meet. Um, mostly endpoints uh, are the computers that individuals and the companies use to access blockchain services. So in this case, the vulnerabilities are both device management and user management. For example, the credentials required to access the blockchain can be a critical element if they are not complex enough. Uh, it is in fact a user limitation and the, the, this reminds us that in cybersecurity, human behavior is the biggest vulnerability used by attackers. They usually do not waste time guessing. So the best chance to get the case is to attack the weakest point of the whole system. That is again, the user, personal computer or mobile device. Whenever blockchain case is uh, our, our, um, our password are entered, displayed or stored in uh, an encrypted manner on uh, such devices, uh, hackers can easily acquire them. If a person do not properly protect their device or leaves the wallet password in some document on their desktop, they are of course very exposed to, to these uh, risks. So uh, as the adoption of blockchain becomes greater and uh, the application that use it grow, we can expect a uh, greater development of this technology, uh, for example, in the, the area of uh, transactions, uh, exchange uh, payments, and even uh, uh, investments. And exactly for this reason, uh, one of the hottest topics of the moment is the one related to the NFTs. 
the non-fungible tokens have emerged as a way to collect uh, digital hearts, as well as an investment vehicle. Despite having been popularized only recently, NFT markets have uh, witnesses are uh, several high profile and high value asset sales and a tremendous growth in uh, trading volumes over the last year. Unfortunately, these marketplaces have not yet received much uh, security screening. Instead, most of academic research has focused on attacks against decentralized finance protocols and uh, automatic techniques to detect smart contract vulnerabilities. We can get a systematic uh, overview of how the NFT ecosystem works, identifying three uh, major players that are marketplaces, external entities, and users. As you may know, a non-fungible token is an uh, ownership record stored on a blockchain such as the Ethereum blockchain. And in, the, in the cryptocurrency world, an NFT is the equivalent of the conventional proof of purchase, such as a paper invoice or um, an ele electronic receipt. Uh, among uh, uh, other things, what makes NFTs attractive are verifiability and trustless uh, transfers. Verifiability means that uh, sales are recorded as blockchain trans transactions, which makes uh, tracking of ownership possible. In addition, the NFT concept allows to, for the trading of digital assets between two mutually dis uh, uh, distrusting parties, as both uh, the crypto payment and the uh, asset transfer happen in a single transaction. Several NFT marketplaces, for example, um, OpenSea or uh, um, Rarible and Axie emerged in uh, recent years to fac facilitate buying and selling NFTs. This has uh, parked, this sparked the interest of uh, both crypto art uh, collector and traders. As the NFT space exploded with uh, multi-million dollar sales, cyber criminals and scammers have inevitably flocked to, into the markets to make quick profits and cheat uh, unsuspecting users. As a result, several NFT scams have also made headlines uh, recently. And by analyzing the scams, malpractices, and security issues, we can see that the main questions to ask in NFT ecosystems are, are there uh, weaknesses in, uh, in the way NFT markets operate today, and can they be um, exploited? How much do outside entities represent a threat to the NFT ecosystem? And are users involved in any fraud or malpractice resulting in financial loss to others? So far as, um, so far as market, marketplaces are uh, concerned, we can uh, identify weaknesses uh, in their own design that can lead to large financial losses for both markets and users. For example, one of the main themes uh, linked to both the cybersecurity and the privacy worlds it's that, uh, is that of the user authentication. A good practice when using these marketplaces is to enable the two-factor authentication, and this option is not yet mandatory on many marketplaces, but uh, it greatly enhances the security of simple password-based authentication. As you can see in this table, with modern computer capabilities, a 10-character password made up only of letters will be hackable in an hour uh, through, through brute force attacks, for example. Another issue uh, concerns the smart contracts that underlie the NFTs. A token contract is considered verifiable if uh, its source code is submitted to Etherscan. And due to the fun fun functional uh, complexity of these uh, token contracts, uh, verifiability of external token contracts is crucial as they can be uh, malicious or buggy. For example, a malicious token contract can be abused to mint more tokens that, uh, the, than the rarity threshold, thus dropping the token's price, which hurts the buyers. Also, a malfunctioning contract can burn gas without uh, even doing any, any real work. As an example, almost all celebrity breeder NFT contract purchase events uh, failed with errors. All these technical aspects can, and many others, uh, are the, the base of uh, some of the most uh, known vulnerabilities in the security world. But nowadays, uh, as we said, uh, the real risk element of this world is the, is the user behavior. The value of the NFT market is uh, estimated today around $20 billion. And this, uh, 
this number would uh, appeal to anyone, but especially to investors who have a strong appetite for risk and uh, who unfortunately expose themselves to the various fraudulent activities that occur in the NFT markets. The uh, fraudulent initiatives that succeed in uh, deceiving the, the greatest number of victims are the creation of counterfeit NFTs, as well as uh, trading malpractices, such as uh, wash trading, uh, shield bidding, or, or bid shielding. In wash trading, the buyer and the seller agree to artificially inflate the trading volume of an asset by carrying out consecutive fictitious trading activities. In NFT markets, users wash trade to either create the illusion for, of uh, demand of, um, for, a, for a specific asset or to inflate the metrics that are of the fin financial interest, uh, such as uh, getting a profile or asset verified uh, or um, collecting rewards. Uh, shield biddings is uh, also a common uh, action fraud in uh, which a seller artificially inflates the financial final price of uh, an asset, uh, either by placing bidding on their own asset or colluding with others bidders to place uh, bids with increasingly high amounts. This can lead uh, honest bidders to pay higher prices than they should. And finally, bid shielding, uh, bid shielding where a malicious bidder places uh, a bid uh, high enough to deter legitimate bidders from placing any additional bids. Uh, immediately before the end of the auction, the malicious uh, user withdraws his bid, uh, thus allowing an accomplice to win the auction uh, with a, a much lower bid. To recap, we can say that today blockchain technology and these features uh, show great potential uh, for the future and in terms of uh, security, diffusion, and possible application. However, many technical and non-technical security aspects should not be taken for granted. And it's always better to get informed and pay attention, especially if the user's purposes are financial. Uh, also, we have to consider all the uh, regulatory, legal, and privacy aspects, uh, many of which are still being defined. And I can now leave the floor to Piero, who can give us a, a useful overview of all these aspects. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Thanks, Goretti, and thanks, ABA, for inviting me. It's been a great pleasure. And yes, I can, I can, you know, let me just share my screen and I'll be very, very quick. There we go. So to, before entering into the data subject, uh, data protection subject, let me give you a brief overview of the, you know, the broad legal environment. So these are my personal views. And of course, based on my years of experience for in the in the subject of blockchain and data protection. So let me just show you this slide. And what can we say about this? I found in my experience that these are four main interesting and still open issues in the broad legal environment surrounding blockchain. So first thing, jurisdiction. Let's talk about this. You know that the blockchain has a decentralized nature and therefore, you know, users, nodes and miners are spread uh, in different countries and therefore also different jurisdictions. So how can we assert the competent judge or, you know, say in other words, what will be the competent judge in case a claim or a case starts? Do we have any clue in how to deal with such a case? This is a very hard question to answer, particularly if we talk about a permissionless and public blockchain, for instance, Bitcoin, or uh, so if a dispute starts in such an environment. Because you know that blockchain has the ability to cross jurisdictional boundaries, so the nodes of a blockchain can be located anywhere in the world. And if we compare this in a conventional banking system uh, or a conventional banking transaction, if the bank is at fault, then irrespective of the mechanisms chosen, you know, a simpler TT transfer or whatever it is, the bank can be sued and therefore we can easily find the applicable jurisdiction. Okay, so moreover, this can be practically, uh, you know, contractually governed. But 
in case of a decentralized uh, situation, the one where we have a blockchain, does anyone have any idea? I, I try to involve you. Please feel free to, to write in the chat and see what are your ideas. Um, let me just find it. If, I, if anyone is texting, I, I try to see if anyone is replying here. And I can give you my, uh, my personal idea. It could be that the node that validates the transaction can be geolocalized and therefore used as the reference point for establishing jurisdiction. This is a, my personal view based on you know, my studies. There is no clear, uh, as, as far as I know, to the best of my knowledge, there is no clear case uh, as far as I know. But this can be an idea, you know, food for thought. The same thing or a, a very close reasoning can be applied for the applicable law. So what governing law can be applied if parties in a blockchain, in a decentralized structure, in a public blockchain, did not specifically chose one, did not specific, specifically chose a governing law? Can, in your opinion, existing laws or regulation on similar issues can help us in this case? Uh, for example, we have in, in the European Union context, we have the Rome 1 regulation that can help us to identify the applicable law to contractual obligations, for instance. You know, we have a, a so-called, there is the concept of characteristic performance. So, which means that to the extent that the law applicable to the contract has not been chosen, of course, by the parties, because in this case, we will have no problem at all. But in case there is no mention of the governing law, the contract shall be governed by the law of the country with which it is most closely connected or where we have, you know, this so-called characteristic performance. I still have some doubts in finding out what can be in a decentralized context, the uh, characteristic performance, so the most closely, you know, obligation of performance of the parties. But this is another open subject. That is why we are talking about this today and in this moment. But you know that if we are dealing with purely digitalized or digital transactions, uh, you know that how can we identify this characteristic performance? This is particularly hard, as I was telling you before. It is very hard in a permissionless uh, context, in a permissionless uh, blockchain. Let's move it on. Liability. You know that in case of errors or malfunctions, in a permissioned a so-called private blockchain, so the one which is governed by a central authority, it may be argued that this is, it is the access provider who will bear the liability and who will respond in case of errors and malfunctions. But in a public or permissionless context, this theme is still unresolved. No one will ever bear liability for a decentralized structure, you know that. Moreover, if I put on the shoes of the original developer, why should be, you know, liable for something like that in the context of a decentralized nature? I just, you know, created the overall structure, but, you know, if we compare this to a normal software licensing agreement, you know that generally speaking, the clause inserted in a licensing agreement are, you know, that the software is given as is without any warranty. So. How can be this so different? This is another, you know, uh, interesting topic that we can maybe discuss later on. And then we have smart contracts. Are they really contracts in a strict sense or simply, as many call them, smart clauses? So therefore, it is a digital transposition or a digital transposition of a clause that took place outside the blockchain, outside the distributed ecosystem. It in you know in 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 other words, it is a what if condition with which when such a condition happens, we have certain consequences. So there are many other open issues or themes that we can talk about. SLA, you know, software uh, performance. Uh, so the performance level be, being always a distributed environment. 
it might not be controllable by the community. You know, if a blackout occurs, it's almost impossible if you talk about the most widely used um, blockchains such as Bitcoin or Ethereum. But what happens in case there is a blockade of mining activities such as the one occurred in China uh, recently? These are really interesting topic to, to, you know, to be investigated also on a legal point of view. I move on to the second slide. This one is also for Nick. I wanted to, you know, intrude myself, but I said, okay, no, Nick is, Nick is going so well. I didn't want to interrupt. But uh, this is, you know, because Nick and I used to work for a couple of years. That's why we are here also today. So uh, before getting into some specific detail, I really like this slide because it, it can show you how data protection and cybersecurity are really closely connected. Because you know that in case we have data protection, there are many unresolved issues in dealing with the DLT solution. I will talk about data minimization, pseudonymization, and some other principles such as retention limitation. And you see that on the other side, there, is the, there are many interesting topics on the cybersecurity level. And Nicolò talked about some of them before. We have the issue of organizational measures, which is very closely connected to the access policy. Who has access to what? And also, of course, probably some of you may know what is a data protection impact assessment. So the problem in assessing the risk related to certain processing activity. If I uh, you know, process personal data within a decentralized context, how can I calculate the risk in case, you know, um, unlawful uh, copy or, you know, a, a normal data breach? Let's talk about in the, the normal case of a data breach. So there are many, you know, in some way unresolved risk, unresolved issues, particularly in the context of a public blockchain. So, you know, uh, let's go into more details now. Uh, there are, as I told you, there are open issues in blockchain and data protection. And the first one is related to GDPR principles. And I'm just giving you three of them, minimization, purpose limitation, and retention limitation. I hope everyone has a sort of, you know, just have a brief idea what these principles are. In any case, I can just briefly explain to you. Uh, minimization, what does it mean? To put it very simply, is, uh, it means less data as possible. So the, a data controller uh, should limit the collection of personal information to what, to personal data, of course, to what is directly relevant and necessary to accomplish a specific purpose. How can this be channeled in a blockchain context, you know, that um, we have to clearly define also what are what is personal from what is non non personal data, which was this is vital, because this will define the potential, you know, data minimization principle, because how can we uh, and this subject is very important also for the data protection by design, which means that I should think in advance what kind of data I can use or I can insert in a blockchain context, but why? Because we have the, the problem, I mean, it's not a problem but on the data protection point of view, it is a problem because we have the immutability in a blockchain context. So a thing, a personal data that are insert in a blockchain in a certain node, in a certain, you know, in a certain block will remain there I mean, hypothetically speaking, forever. So this is also a problem and it's also closely related to the purpose limitation because once I define, I myself being the data controller, so the entity who is you know, in charge of defining purpose, means, and the necessity of processing data, I'm the one who is in charge of decisions, to put it very simply in this context. So this is also very close because this is also very close. And you see that even if you can think, oh, I don't really care about principles, but we need to, to, to start by uh, taking into consideration these very simple principles in data protection, at least on a GDPR point of view, to understand that 
it is very closely connected with the data protection by design and therefore i need to understand what's my purpose what kind of data i insert in a blockchain and what can be the risk considering immutability and the principle of retention limitation which is very simply put I cannot save a data, a personal data forever. So this is a very, very, you know, slippery slope when we talk about a blockchain in this context. Okay. So uh, banal, but very important to remember, GDPR applies to personal data, of course, uh, which are those related to natural persons. And the problem here is related to data, you know, personal, pseudonymized and anonymized. Because how can I define where a data is no longer a personal data because it has been, you know, put under the process of anonymization. Here, Nick could help me in that, but I, not, I don't want to involve you anymore. But the problem is that when I, when I you know, when I start to uh, think about what kind of data, what kind of personal data I should insert uh, within a, a block. I need to understand, should I anonymize? What is the technique that I will use to make this personal data no longer a personal data? Because remember that when I anonymize the data, I should not, in theory, be able to reverse this process. I should not be able to find out or to go back to the original data. And also for me, it could be, you know, there are different techniques uh, of anonymization, but the problem is, identifiability how can i really you know uh, assess the identifiability uh, threshold in the sense that this can be subject also to technological progress you know there is a huge um, i don't know discussion regarding the ash function because in theory an ash function i mean based on the uh, technology we have today because i not i don't want to talk i don't want to talk about any quantum computing or potentially what can be the progress in you know computational uh, power i i want to say what i can assess now the identifiability threshold because someday a person a, a data that has been anonymized can no longer be an anonymized data so it's going to be also a problem in that that I should carefully evaluate. And last but not least, data protection roles. We know that there is the controller, which is at the, the entity in charge of decision. But also this one is also an interesting one because we you may think, well, I mean, in the centralized context, there is no controller at all. Yes, but remember that we should find one in the sense that we all know that the controller is the one who also is in charge of decision, which means he should decide, he or she should decide technical measures, uh, fill in the register of processing activities, uh, having in place a correct information of this, and so on and on. So all the normal GDPR obligations. But who can fill this role in a public blockchain? Because you know that you cannot formally appoint and say, okay, the controller is a person X, Y, and Z. I don't really care about that because we need to take into consideration real and effective control. It is not simply appointing someone only formally, but we need to take care of a real and effective control. And also remember that the definition is broad. And if I can give you a sort of um, way through this uh, labyrinth, I can say that priority must be given to the purpose for the processing and not on the means. The means are, you know, what kind of mechanism or what kind of technological solution I choose to process a certain data. So the purpose is the why. So we should start with why, like, like some a famous writer used to say in a book. So in a decentralized context, probably the real role or the most important role will be the one of the joint controllers. We recall Article 26 of GDPR, and there is also a famous ECG case. So uh, the Court of Justice of the European Union, it was related to a Germany-based case where we talk about a Facebook page created by a school. In this case, 
the issue here concerned the fact that starting from that reasoning, from the one, as I told you, the German case, we could argue that anyone who decides to use a DLT, to use a blockchain, to implement the processing activity could be considered to be a joint controller. The problem is who forced you to use a blockchain? No one. You decided to use that. So potentially, theoretically speaking, uh, you can be you know, considered to act as a joint controller. So as you see, um, what is the aim of all, the, of all this slide is to understand that the most important issue here is to provide protection to data. So therefore to data subjects, because we need to, to take also into consideration a, a broader definition of joint controllers in this sense. So I move on and I tell you, are there any specific topics that are related to NFT only? Think about data and metadata and so on and on, because we know that an NFT is basically a digital and unique representation, a so-called a kind of certificate that certifies certain characteristics or peculiarities of a object, of an art object, or whatever we are talking about. So NFT are simply an evolution, you know, over a relatively simple concept of cryptocurrency. So it is still a digital representation of value and unique value. That's why we are here, we are talking about an NFT. The thing it is that as of now, there is no real or you know, specific issue related to NFT only. There is none. Because we are here, we are facing the same problems related to immutability, to data protection by design, to understand what are the roles, because we are, we are talking in, about an evolution of, a, of something like what is a distributed ledger. So it's just a new application of that. I hope, I mean, uh, I probably ran out of time. I should, I should leave, I should leave time to Marina. I'm so sorry. Probably we don't have enough time, but that's what I wanted to say. The key take, the key takeaway is really be careful because there are still open issues when we talk about data protection and blockchain applications. And moreover, think really carefully about the data protection by design. So understanding in advance what can be the, uh, you know, how much personal data I should use, what kind of technique, what, what is the access policy and considerations like that. I shut down, I stop, I'm sorry. Well, thank you, Nick and Piero. So I know that Marina has been doing some research on data privacy from the policy standpoint as well. So would you like to share with us uh, what you have found out on the boundaries of decentralized tools, Marina? Yes, definitely. Um, and can I just ask to move to the next slide, please? Perfect. So my comments today will build on what we just heard from Nicolò and Piero's analysis already, um, but move us into a little bit more of the US context. I've put some headlines um, on the slide here, and we're going to kind of walk through them and, and try to make sense. So first of all, at a national level, the US finds ourselves without much of a clear delineation of regulatory or legal statutes. Um, President Biden, in, in an effort to kind of clarify this space, issued an executive order um, a few weeks ago. And the EO, it must be said, does not specify any new regulations for the cryptocurrency industry, but it directs federal agencies and departments to examine the risks and benefits posed by this technology and submit a report um, on the adoption of a US central bank digital currency. So, it's, it's unlikely we'll receive more comprehensive framework in the near term, but what we can still learn um, through this executive order um, and through other elements of the regulatory environment are some of the rules of the road. Um, and, and I'm gonna work to dissect some of those today. So first, um, there in the US, there's kind of a push and a pull between the SEC, so the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. Um, the, these two bodies uh, largely arise, and, and this push and pull largely arises from the debate about what is crypto? What is a blockchain application? Are we talking about a security? Are we talking about a commodity, property, an asset? Um, 
you know, this is really an evolving area of the law and, and there's no consensus on the topic. So we can get some insights um, on where these bodies sort of see their mandate within the crypto environment. Um, and, and we can take a look first at the SEC. So the SEC's mandate focuses primarily on protecting investors in the realm of securities. And um, a few weeks ago, the chair of the SEC, Gensler, um, kind of asserted that crypto exchanges are likely uh, trading a product that would meet the definition of a security. Um, you know, he didn't say it is a security, but likely meet the definition, you know, beautiful, beautiful vocabulary there. Um, and I'll sort of highlight three main areas where he's asked staff to direct their attention um, in terms of moving forward with SEC um, guidance. So number one, he is interested in getting platforms registered and, and regulated, much like traditional exchanges. Two, um, crypto platforms currently list both crypto commodity tokens and crypto security tokens. So that includes crypto tokens like investment contracts. Um, and in fact, this point is an area where the SEC can work with the CFTC on addressing such platforms that might trade both crypto-based security tokens and some commodity tokens as well. So these two bodies aren't always in opposition of one another, but there's an opportunity for them to come together given the, the product that, that we're talking about. Um, and number three, um, Gensler was really interested also in directing efforts towards crypto custody and the, the question um, of, of custody. So unlike traditional exchanges, crypto trading platforms sometimes take custody of their customers' assets. Um, last year, more than $14 billion of value was stolen. And the SEC in its mandate is working to ensure that platforms are registered and regulated in order to ensure the protection of customers' assets at that custodial level, at that maybe wallet level that we might think of. So the SEC you know, isn't just uh, studying the problem like we might see in the executive order, um, but you can see on one of my slides, they recently charged a company called BlockFi, which is a crypto exchange, with failing to register the offering of its retail crypto lending product um, among other violations. And as you can see, BlockFi has now agreed to pay close to a million dollars in penalties. Um, and this, this settlement kind of arose from pre-crypto securities laws. And the SEC is applying these securities laws to BlockFi into this case. So they're applying the Securities Act of 1933, and they're applying the Investment Company Act of 1940. So it's interesting to see how, you know, what can we learn about the rules of the road um, from previous legislation and how is it adapting um, given the environment today. Um, on the other hand, the CFTC, which is a smaller agency, has less of an enforcement program, um, but the CFTC has announced that crypto is a commodity. So that's creating kind of a different, uh, you know, a different debate. But um, what we can see is that principles-based definitions and coordination mechanisms across agencies are necessary. And quite frankly, Congress could provide greater clarity in this uh, area. Several bills are in Congress at the moment. And uh, from what I've heard, none have a clear path to the finish line for various reasons and, and happy to talk about that um, offline. But the regulatory ambiguity and potential penalties that, that we can see here have inspired some states at the state level to take their own action. So um, I just wanted to highlight one instance um, of, of Wyoming. Um, they've kind of taken themselves out of the commodity versus securities debate and sort of asserted crypto as property. So in 2019, Wyoming became the first state to enact legislation that established digital assets, such as crypto, NFTs, this could apply to a variety of other products, as intangible property. And so it sort of situated um, 
crypto and other blockchain um, tools in the framework of state property rights, property protection, enforcement, sale, lease, licensing, all these nice, all these nice words. So um, these are some of the frames where we can kind of understand the US environment. Um, and instead, let's, uh, let's also take a look at enforcement, because as I said before, sometimes you'll hear the phrase regulation by enforcement, what does this mean? Um, and we can think about investigations and enforcement bodies separately from enforcement results. So there's a lot of enforcement and investigations bodies. Um, the FBI has one, the DOJ has one, the list really goes on. And what they focus on um, is to investigate um, and potentially either prosecute or seize assets. Um, and I'd be happy to address how seizure happens later on in the Q&A. But to, to sort of wrap up, I wanted to also address the issue of sanctions. Um, so I'm sure most of the audience here are aware of the fact that Russia is currently facing a serious sanctions regime, not just from the United States, but from many countries around the world. Um, and my one of my one of my slides there or screenshots of the headline um, says, you know, maybe we've seen headlines similar to that one where um, there's speculation about, you know, are the Russian oligarchs now going to start buying Dubai mansions with crypto and be able to evade sanctions? You know, what what are we going to see here? And I think it's important to recognize that contrary to this this picture. What we have seen is that there is not such a significant spike in sanctions evasion by currently um, designated Russian entities. Um, why? Mostly because the relationship between crypto and fiat currency still really holds and exchange exchanges or, or wallets, if we want to think about maybe Coinbase here, um, still remain under US jurisdiction and have strong incentives reputationally and financially to adhere and, and cooperate with US policy. So at present, it's important to note that there are no broad sanctions applied to all Russian entities, but some platforms also like PayPal I've seen recently have decided to self-regulate and remove any Russian um, entities from their platform. So that's a bit different from US policy versus a corporate policy there. Um, and if you want to talk a bit more about how the Russian case is different, maybe from the Iran or North Korea case, um, I'd happy to do that later. Um, I have a paper coming out under the ABA's Middle East Review on, um, on uh, sanctions designations and enforcement um, on Iran and sort of the intersection there with crypto. So um, I'll sort of conclude there um, and just uh, finalize my, my last sentence, which is really that there are tools to identify and investigate um, sanctioned actors or, or malicious actors. Um, you can look at a company called Chain Analysis and remove them from these platforms. But um, I had the chance to interact with a few um, lawyers from a blockchain investment firm, um, and they, they made it very clear that identity verification, so if you're thinking about kind of the the tools that chain analysis might use connected to instances of fraud um, present a, a really major opportunity in in this field um, so for future work on the legal aspects and on the technical aspects um, in in blockchain so um, looking forward to to the discussion and uh, hope hope we um, sort of started started the conversation uh, there so I'll, I'll finish there Great, thank you, Marina. That's really fascinating. And I would just like to remind the audience that this webinar is educational um, in nature only, and the views expressed here are the speakers own and do not constitute any investment or financial or legal advice or the views of the affiliations. So, yeah, so I have a question myself, and I think some of the audience is, um, you know, thinking along this line too. So when we are speaking of uh, the crypto, the blockchain, the ecosystem that we are speaking, that its advantage is also its weakness in that uh, is a decentralized uh, nature. But then when people are doing things on their own that the platform uses uh, their um, consumers as well, then there is no liability when it comes to cyber attacks or any um, 
you know, cyber crimes. So I'm curious as to how um, the panelists that will think uh, the system would evolve. And then especially when governments everywhere in the world are now trying to regulate this uh, realm. So, um, and then like, it, you know, eventually may not become uh, decentralized anymore. So does anyone want to chime in here? Sure, I can maybe take Marina. That. Yeah, yeah, I can take that one. Um, so I I have to say that I don't see for this to be the case at the moment. That there's there's no liability in the case of um, in in the case of of cyber attacks or kind of malicious actors and what category uh, you know what defines a malicious actor and what the intent there is um, because there's there's liability on from a few different angles. I mean, are we talking about the user itself? Are we talking about the company that's enabling um, certain transactions? Um, you know, as, as I mentioned before, there companies do, some companies, maybe not all, but some companies really are implementing their own tools to identify malicious activity and, and remove it from their platform. So maybe more from the, cyber attacks or cybersecurity um, angle, someone else on the panel could could pick that one up. But, um, you know, regulation is there and also enforcement is definitely there. So um, companies are, are adapting the enforcement outcomes to their own internal policies. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I've been hearing some news on the digital uh, euro that, uh, you know, the EU has been trying to um, come around with the central bank. So, Pierre, do you have any um, thoughts on that, opinions? You uh, mean regarding yeah. central bank digital currency? Yeah, like the digital euro and then like the problem that you raised about um, is going to be you know, like the consumers themselves who are trying to use the platforms themselves, that there no one is trying to force them to use it. So how does the government come into the picture? Well, uh, I think governments come when there is a problem for stability and particularly when you think it now, the all the cryptocurrency market cap is roughly two trillion. So to, uh, you know, it's a huge, it's a huge market. I'm thinking out loud and I'm talking about the Mika regulation. So the market in crypto asset regulation that is coming in a couple of years is it, and it is now subject to this discussion between EU Commission, uh, European Council and the European Parliament. In particular, they came out with this proposal for a regulation when we were talking about Libra project. So the one from Facebook, now Mira, whatever. The thing is that government come when there is a problem for stability and probably i would say but this is also again my personal view when there is also a threat for them because a decentralized nature can impose a threat at cert to a certain extent in relation to the and that is why probably they are investing a lot in this uh, you know uh, dlt based uh, uh, currency solution i personally think it is a good evolution it is a good expenditure of what was Satoshi Nakamoto idea. But if we think about when, uh, you know, a Bitcoin started in 2008, after a certain financial period, we understand that the uh, original philosophy behind cryptocurrency was a little bit different. Again, personal views. Right. And then um, there are also some questions that we've been seeing around the smart contract structure and the data privacy. Um, you know, that's um, because we are talking about the immutable ledger. So how does it um, come when it uh, involves a data minimization? It's like once you put it in the record, you can't be removed anymore, you can't modify it. And how do we achieve data uh, minimization across, you know, the metaverse? Yeah, I replied to that uh, privately, probably I because I was waiting and I was just checking some questions. The thing is that you can resolve or you can take care of data minimization. So as, data, as less data as possible, 
when you think about it in advance, so when you abide by the principle of data protection by design and by default, so which means that once you register something in a blockchain that is tamper proof, immutable, and there is going to be there forever, but you need to think about it in advance that. One of the solution they are thinking, and they said, is it, it is more of a technical solution, and I add that to my you know, uh, private uh, answer to that, is that they think of transforming using an hash function, transforming the, what is personal data in an hash function, so the result of the hash, hash function, and then inserting that hash in the block, which means in this way you are perfectly anonymized data, you insert that, but you that have the original data can still use and can still have access to the personal data that are you know, protected by the hash function result. But this is an idea, uh, more of a technical solution, but it's also good that we talk about that. Thanks for that. Right, and uh, I'm aware of the time that we are approaching the hour. And I just want to, um, you know, um, thank, um, you know, all of the audience for coming and then the panelists for uh, speaking at the ABA uh, in webinar. And before we just wrap it up, um, can I just ask each of the speaker to give us one takeaway for the audience to think about? Yeah, anyone can start. Let me let me start. Um, once again, there are open issues uh, in, in relation to data protection. The CNIL, La CNIL, which is the, uh, the French data protection authority, authority, is very active and they, um, you know, publish a very interesting paper on this GDPR and blockchain related issues. So I strongly suggest to read it. But in any case, believe me, one of the most important principles here is data protection by design and by default, Article 25 of GDPR. That is my view on that. And it is my key takeaway for today. Maybe I can add something. I would uh, just like to mention the one of the common sayings about um, security and cybersecurity, which is that uh, security is uh, always excessive uh, until it uh, is not enough. So get informed, experiment, and take advantage, advantage of um, new opportunities uh, that come your way um, with, with blockchain and these tech new technologies, but don't take anything for, for granted. Thank you. So I'll sort of build on that as well. Um, so as we can see, the regulatory environment is evolving. And the US is only one such context where we can see a few of these patterns from global markets. But what has remained clear to me is that blockchain tools and especially cryptocurrencies are still heavily intertwined with the US market. And so US regulation and enforcement actions have the ability to impact decentralized platforms around the world. So I'm happy to talk more about it at a later time with our participants today. Um, and, and thank you to the organizers for, for having me as well. Yeah, so uh, let me just um, try to get that, yeah. And then for any participants uh, who would like to get into um, contact with the speakers, we are leaving the details um, in the chat box as well. So feel free to reach out um, for further questions. And uh, please join us for the um, upcoming series in the ABA section of International Law, Young Lawyers Interest Network series. And then please watch out for um, the articles that Marina is going to publish. And Piero is also publishing an article on the philosophical aspects of the change of the regulatory regime. Um, I think that is gonna be on his website, right, Piero? Yeah, that yeah. is correct. He's saying yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I see. And yeah, and if you will be in uh, DC on uh, April 29, um, you can check out the ABA International Law Annual Conference as well. Uh, the Art and Cultural Heritage Committee will be presenting the return of cultural projects, provenance, new tech and ethics at the Capitan Hilton Hotel in Washington, DC. And then let's um, 
yeah, I'm trying to um, send the link here in the chat box so you guys can have a look. And then um, we will be sending the recording of this webinar about a week later of this webinar. And yeah, so I will give everyone uh, to your, uh, we, you can um, go back to your work right now. So, and uh, thank you all for coming and I uh, hope to see you next time.